good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Aletheia Baptist Church Christian Enrichment. Our lesson for the day, Isaiah's Commission. Time is 739 BC. The place is Jerusalem. The golden text, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Lesson outline, Roman numeral one, the prophet's vision. That's Isaiah six, one to four. Roman numeral two, the prophet's response. Isaiah six, five through eight. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your great kindness. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to, to gather around your word, Lord, and see what you have for us today. Lord, we ask that you give me the grace to present this message in a way that you may be glorified and that your peoples may be edified. You say it in all of my ways if I acknowledge you that you will direct my path. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Under King David's leadership, the nation of Israel was united. After the death of David, his son Solomon became king. Upon the death of Solomon, his son Rehoboam and Jeroboam became king over the nation. They divided the nation. Jeroboam took the 10 tribes and went north. This is known as the Northern Kingdom. Rehoboam became king over the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. They remained there in Jerusalem, the capital. Because of God's covenant with David, Jerusalem was God's chosen place of worship. Jerusalem is known as the southern kingdom. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. So we have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Also, the northern kingdom went by the name of Israel. The southern kingdom went by the name Judah because Judah was the larger of the two tribes out of Judah and Benjamin. When Isaiah the prophet came on the scene around 755 BC, God sent Isaiah to be a prophet to the tribe of Judah under the kingship of Uzziah. Isaiah's message to the nation was a message of judgment and hope. Now, liberal scholars have a hard time accepting Isaiah as the author of this book. Their problem is how can Isaiah predict that a king would come on the scene, King Cyrus, and allow Judah to return from Jerusalem, return to Jerusalem from, ben, from Babylonian captivity 150 years to 200 years before Cyrus was ever born and before the nation ever went into captivity, they have a problem with that. So they came up with this theory that it had to be three Isaiahs. The first Isaiah wrote from chapter one to chapter 39. The second Isaiah wrote, or they call it Deuteros Isaiah, wrote from chapter 40 to chapter 55. The third Isaiah, or trio Isaiah, wrote from chapter 56 to chapter 66. The book is generally identified as the work of an anonymous prophet. Isaiah is the longest book in the Bible. The Bible has 66 books. Isaiah has 66 chapters. When John the Baptist was being questioned about uh, as to who he was, he quoted from Isaiah 43. 
John said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said Isaiah the prophet. John contributed the book to Isaiah the prophet. Luke 4, 16, Jesus, when he came to Nazareth, where he was brought up, and as custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up and read verse 17. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and the recover of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book. Jesus quoted from Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah 61.1. When King Uzziah died, the son of Jotham became king. His son Jotham became king. Jotham was a good king. He listened to Isaiah. Upon Jotham's death, his son Ahaz became king. Ahaz was a wicked king. He worshiped the god of Molech by offering up his children when he died, his son, they buried him not with the kings because of his idolatry and because of his wickedness. They did not bury him with the kings when he died. Upon his death, his son Hezekiah became king. Hezekiah was a good king. He was considered to be a very righteous king. God sent Isaiah to tell Hezekiah to get his house in order because he was going to die. When Isaiah told King Hezekiah, King Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed. And before Isaiah could get out of the temple courtyard, God sent Isaiah back to tell King Hezekiah that he was going to add 15 years to his life. Upon Hezekiah's death, his son Manasseh became king. Manasseh was a wicked king. He came to power at the age of 12 years old. J. Vernon McGee said that in his opinion, the nation of Judah would have been better off if God would have allowed Hezekiah to die and not add 15 years to his life. Because within that 15 years, Manasseh was born. Manasseh was a wicked king. He was wicked to the core. Manasseh practiced every conceivable evil and perversion, devoted himself to witchcraft. He was a murderer. He even sacrificed his own sons to a pagan god. God's judgment fell on Manasseh. He was bound in chain and taken away to Babylon. According to the ascension of Isaiah is an extra biblical sources. Manasseh got so angry with Isaiah that he put Isaiah in a hollow log and sawed him in two. We see hints of this in Hebrews 11, 37 states. Some died by stoning some were sawed in half, and others was killed with the sword. Isaiah's ministry lasted over 50 years. Isaiah was not the only prophet on the scene at this time. Amos was on the scene at this time. He was from Jerusalem, but God sent him to the northern kingdom Israel. His message was a message of justice. The rich was getting richer, and the poor was getting poor. They were selling the helpless peoples off to other countries. Hosea was on the scene at this time. He was from the northern kingdom. His message was also 
to the northern kingdom. Hosea's message was a message of judgment because of their unfaithfulness, idolatry. God told Hosea to marry a woman that he knew would eventually betray his trust. And by giving his children names that sent a message to, of judgment on Israel. Michael was on the scene during this time. He also was from Judah. But his message to the northern kingdom was also to Judah as well. Michael's message was to both nations. It was a message of the lowly, unjust business dealing, robbery, mistreatment of women and children, a government that lived in luxury off the hard work of the nation peoples. That sounds like America, don't it? In our lesson today, King Uzziah dies. He did not die of natural causes. While king, things were going very well for the nation of Judah. King Uzziah began to pat himself on the back. He got lifted up in pride until he wanted to be a god like the pharaohs. He went into the temple to attempt to offer incense up to God in violating God's priestly law. Eighty-two priests begged him not to do this thing. He did not listen. He told them, if you get in my way, I'm going to kill you. God sent an earthquake on Jerusalem so powerful the roof of the temple. And this is Solomon's temple now. The roof split open, a very bright light shined into the roof, into the face of King Uzziah. God struck the king with leprosy. He lived the rest of his life as a leper. King Uzziah died as a leper. The prophet Amos talked about the earthquake during the reign of King Uzziah. Amos spoke of the land being shaken Houses being smashed, the altar being cracked, even the temple at Bethel began to shaken and collapsed. The prophet Zechariah talked about the great earthquake. Zechariah 14, 5. You will flee through this valley, for it will reach across Azel. Yes, you will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of King of Zion, Judah. The Jewish historian Josephus said that the earthquake was so powerful that it toppled every mountain within 62 miles of Jerusalem. Our lesson outline, Roman number one, the prophet's vision. And in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. In our lesson this morning, we talked about several kings. King Manasseh, a wicked king, he led the nation away from God in idolatry. He was a Satan worshiper, and he saw the prophet Isaiah in half. He went into captivity with chains and he died in captivity. We talked about King Ahaz, a wicked king. He too led the peoples away from the Lord through idolatry. He also sacrificed his sons and eventually he died. We talked about King Hezekiah. He was a good king a godly king. His policies brought the peoples close to God through proper worship. God fought their battles. They lived in peace and prosperity on the King Hezekiah, but eventually King Hezekiah died. We talked about King Uzziah. He was a good king, a godly king. 
his policies brought the peoples close to God through proper worship. He expanded the nation's border. He lived in peace and prosperity, even though he allowed proud to, claw, to cloud his thinking, he suffered the consequences, but God did not, God does not define a man by his one mistake. God yet considered him to be a good king, but eventually he died. But when God gave Isaiah a vision of heaven, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord sitting up on the throne high and lifted up. The gist of our lesson is this. Kings may go. Kings may come and kings may go. But yet the Lord remains seated upon the throne. Either good king, bad king, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, Yet God remains seated upon the throne. God is sovereign, and he is in charge of this universe. Amen? The throne represents a place of power. For the throne to be elevated represents honor that the person is due. In other words, the person sitting up on the throne is worthy of your honor. We all have seen movies about kings, you know, they wore long robes. It's called a train. The end of the robe is called a train. It speaks of his conquering power over his enemies. The longer the train, the greater the power. His train, speaking of God, filled the temple, speaks of God even greater conquering power over evil. John 11, 38, 44, Jesus' resurrection was a true and total defeat of death. Death is an enemy. The train also represents God's glory. Verse 2, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet. And with two, he did fly. Even though these angels are sinless, they are still created beings. To cover their face says that they are too lowly to look upon the Lord. God told Moses, no man can look upon my face and live. Man is a created being and so are the angels. This could apply to them as well. Also, they can't endure the brightness of God. When we go outside and look up at the sun, what we do? We cover our face, right? Amen. They couldn't look up on the brightness of God. The most humble or lowly part of our body is our feet. If there was any deficiencies on our body, most likely it's going to be our feet. That's why most women go and get their feet done every two weeks, because they don't want their husband to look upon their deficiencies. My wife used to tell me all the time, JC, you got some rough looking feet. So guess what I did? I started doing what she do. I go get my feet done. And she don't talk about my feet anymore. So the angels hid their feet in the presence of the Lord so that no deficiencies would be seen in his presence. Also, hiding the feet speak of their unworthiness and their humbleness in the presence of the Lord. With two he flew. This speak of their willingness and ability to serve the Lord and carry out his command. They stand ready to go at God's command. Verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The seraphims here are proclaiming God's glorious nature and character to one another in the presence of the Lord. In Hebrew language, intensity 
is communicated by repetition. They say holy three times is to declare his holiness in the highest degree possible. Holy means to be set apart. God is set apart from humanity in that his nature is and his essence is divine and not human. Holiness is one of God's characteristics of God's entire being. Yet because of his love, grace, and mercy, he is involved in the affairs of men. Verse 4. And the post of the door moved, and the voice of him that cried out, cried, and, and the house was filled with smoke. Verse 3 appears to be the song that they are singing. They sang so powerfully that the doorpost was shaken. The smoke here represents the presence of God. We see, we saw the presence of God in the form of smoke on Mount Sinai. The cloud of God, Shekinah glory, filled the temple in 1 Kings. Roman numeral 2, the prophet response. Isaiah 6, 5 through 8. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The first two things I learned when I went to Crossroad was that the more you learn about God, the more you realize that you don't know. The second thing I learned in Crossroad was that the closer you get to God, the more you realize just how far away you are. Isaiah's vision of the throne of God did not immediately make him feel good. The more clearly he saw the Lord, the more clearly he saw how bad his state was. Isaiah's deep sense of depravity is consistent with that of Peter. When Peter realized who Jesus was, he fell at his feet and said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. When Job met the Lord, he said, Therefore I abhor myself. And repented in dust and ashes. Keep in mind, dust and ashes is on the ground. Isaiah, uh, Job fell flat on his face. Abhor is the strongest word in the English language. It means to hate yourself. Dis be disgusted with yourself. Job said, I am disgusted with myself. I hate myself. John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Daniel said, when he has spoken such words to me, I turned my face to the ground and became speechless. Daniel lost his voice. Woe is a sign of judgment. Isaiah must have concluded that his life was over. Undone has the idea that something is coming apart. Isaiah felt that his life was coming apart. When Isaiah saw the angel in all their holy humility, obedience, and praise to God, he realized not only that he was unlike the angels, he was unlike was unlike the Lord, he was unlike the angels. They cried, holy, 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 and praised God so beautifully, but he could not because he was a man of unclean lips. When Isaiah saw the Lord, he knew that what kind of man he was. As proudly as he, as poorly as he compared himself to the seraphim, that was nothing in relation to him compared to the Lord. Isaiah saw his sinfulness and the sinfulness of the peoples, mainly in the term of sinful speech. Isaiah did not think for a moment that he, 
this was his only sin. He saw that this was an example of the great and incurable disease of sin in him and his people. Isaiah was a righteous, godly man, but from an outward appearance. Yet, when he saw the enthroned king, the Lord of hosts, he saw himself sinful in comparison to God. I think that we are walking on very dangerous grounds when we begin to compare ourselves with each other or with other peoples. What's so dangerous about it, it opens the door for pride. That's what happened to King Uzziah. He got caught up in pride. If you come up here and stand beside me, you might look pretty good. Hypothetically speaking, but if you go and stand beside the Lord, he will give you a clear picture of just what you look like. When Isaiah compared himself with the Lord, he said, whoa, I am about to come apart. That's what the word means, undone. It means to come apart. Isaiah was shaking so bad he thought his whole body was finna come apart. I am undone. When God showed Job himself, Job said, I am disgusting. I hate myself. God told Satan Job was a blameless and upright man, but standing next to God, Job said, I hate myself. I'm just disgusting. I think far too often young preachers, I don't mean in age, compare themselves with the pastor. Pride set in. And when pride set in, God can't use a man when, when pride sets in. And what mostly happened to them is that their ministry become ineffective or God would just put them on the shelf. That's what happened to King Uzziah. Pride set in. He said in his heart, I can do what the priests do, maybe even better. God took him out of office and put him on the shelf. Verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. The throne is for God. That is where he rule and reign. The altar is for us. That's where we find cleansing and purging from sin. God was cleansing Isaiah from his sins. Verse 7. And he laid, upon, he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thou sins purged. Obviously, this was a spiritual transformation. If a man had a sinful mouth, placing hot coal on his lips is going to do nothing to change his heart. But it will shut him up for a while. Uh, Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. God changed Isaiah's heart. In verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whoa, who shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. God has a great sense of humor. The God of the universe is asking his created beings a question. What is God doing? In ancient Middle Eastern religion, only divine beings are sent as messengers of gods. That would be, in this case, it would be the angels. What God is doing 
he is prompting a response from Isaiah. Isaiah said, hey, hey, don't send the angels. Send me. I'll go. What will we say? What will I say? What will we all say when God said, who shall I send? Isaiah willingness to go proceeded from a grateful heart. Isaiah wanted to serve the Lord who had forgiven him of all of his sins. And we should have that same attitude even today. That we should be grateful to the Lord for what he has done for us. When I was a kid, my dad uh, sang in a group called the Nightingales. And he sang a song, if the Lord wants somebody, here am I, send me, I'll go. And when he began to sing that song, the piano began to play and the guitars began to play, the women would just jump up and shout and dance and wigs would go flying everywhere. And I was, it was good entertainment for me. I, I enjoyed it. And it was entertainment. I was a kid, so forgive me, but it was good entertainment. But, and that we should have that same response whom the Lord have said. We all should say, if the Lord wants somebody, here am I, send me, I'll go. And we thank the Lord for this lesson this morning. We pray that you all was blessed. Amen. Amen. Amen.